thank you for uh, all the efforts that the World Academy of Art and Science is doing in uh, promoting this uh, very important framework, actually, for uh, reconsidering, uh, let's say, human security from much uh, broader perspective and much more articulated to what can be done. And uh, from that perspective, the efforts that have been done in the last period, the global partnerships that you are developing with the United Nations, with, uh, let's say, large organizations with a huge impact, uh, this uh, have to be a very important uh, attempt, let's say, in that uh, sense. So uh, we could say that our session, unfortunately, from all this picture of the very nice uh, conference, Probably this is the most difficult <laughs> session <laughs> because uh, uh, why we say that? I mean, uh, it is, uh, let's say, uh, a very way, a very nice way to define concepts, to, uh, sp uh, you know, use uh, a, a scientific approach to, to define different type of needs and then to define processes and so on. But everything is jeopardized at the moment when we have let's say a conflict and we have let's say a uh, national disaster a natural disaster a cataclysm so all these aspects are becoming suddenly in a complete different uh, frame so from that perspective uh, we would like to thank for um, accepting our proposal to address this uh, very important uh, challenge in uh, this very important day, which uh, is the International Women's Day. And I would like to uh, uh, thank to all uh, ladies, actually Yanani is in the background, but also Olena is uh, here with us for uh, participating in the development of this uh, concept. Let us say uh, welcome also to President Deneken. <laughs> Bonjour, <laughs> from Strasbourg. So uh, it has been a very, very special discussion that we had uh, in Strasbourg at the Council of at the Parliament, uh, the European Parliament building, discussing about the schisma within the religious uh, history together. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you for the very special speakers that are accepted to, to join us and to share, uh, let's say, the, the views in this. And uh, because it is a very special day, allow me to make the first, let's say, adjustment to our uh, program and to kindly ask Olena to uh, uh, start uh, speaking as ladies first, because it's a very difficult attempt. But in any case, uh, we would like also to draw the attention to the very important aspect that is happening in this time zone of uh, Southeast uh, Europe. So do Dr. Olena Zukova, she's a naval architect. Uh, she um, uh, developed a very important career in the field of um, engineering uh, and uh, she is now working with a very important uh, group uh, that is the Daman group and uh, besides of all these activities she is doing a fantastic work in uh, the service of the community so uh, Olena please uh, start uh, this uh, session with your view of what is happening now in Ukraine uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, many thanks to Professor Mahmoud for inviting uh, me to this uh, event. It is special day. It has different context now, whether it is Women's Day or Women's Rights Day. There is a lot of discussion, but what is nice is that there is attention to this uh, topic. But uh, today, uh, of course, uh, my uh, primary uh, topic is Ukraine. Uh, I am a Ukrainian and uh, I want to share with you my presentation and the video about how uh, war impacted our lives, uh, our community, which uh, appreciates education, development, innovation and life in general, but uh, we are under special circumstances. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Ukrainian Maritime Cluster. But uh, on the example of our engineering company, which uh, is a member of uh, Diamond Group, 
And my message to all of you is that together we are stronger. So uh, our company, uh, MDM, was uh, founded by them in about 15 years ago. We uh, have completed more than 400 successful uh, engineering projects. Uh, we have uh, more than 200 skilled employees. We occupied more than 3,000 square meters of office, modern office facilities. We have developed seven competence centers, and we were in two locations in Ukraine. But uh, so um, there was also uh, a lot of activities of uh, our company uh, in uh, social life and public life of our community. And uh, MDM is uh, the found, one of the founders of Ukrainian Maritime Cluster. We have developed training center for National University of Shipbuilding in Nikolai. We uh, practice dual education and invite uh, students we, we, uh, as employees. And uh, we uh, a lot, uh, about 10% of our employees have undergone uh, such a program. Uh, we have uh, sport teams, corporate events, and a couple of words about uh, myself. I'm the founder and the director of MDM of this company from the beginning till now. I'm associate professor in National University of Shipbuilding on the Maritime Economy Department, and I'm executive director of Ukrainian Maritime Cluster. So, uh, but uh, what happened, the war has started uh, more than a year ago now, and it divided our lives uh, into before and after the Russian full-scale invasion. Uh, I am in Nikolaev right now, and I have spent here most of the time during the war, although I was traveling abroad. Uh, so uh, we know the life in our city uh, quite well. Ukrainian cities have been ruthlessly bombarded, and Nikolaev as well was under fire for nine months. And this is our governor's office, and this attack uh, has taken also lives, not only the building. Uh, ruined buildings, hundreds of them, but damaged in Nikolai, private houses, uh, offices, universities. Our National University of Shipbuilding have been under attack two times. Uh, the uh, employees and our colleagues have lost uh, their housing, and MDM office, our engineering office, was damaged too. Uh, we have had an office in Kherson, but after Kherson occupation, we had to close our office. And uh, people had to be evacuated under extreme circumstances. Some of them had to go via aggressor state when the borders from the Ukrainian side were not possible to cross. So uh, we have five employees serving in the Ukrainian army, and unfortunately, one employee has perished in the first months of the war. Uh, how the life in Ukraine is right now, in the whole Ukraine, uh, about half of uh, energy infrastructure is destroyed for now. Blackouts and power cuts have been very uh, spread. Uh, now it is a better situation, but uh, we never know what next uh, aggression step would be. There was dark and cold at homes and offices uh, during winter. We are lucky that winter was uh, a bit mild. And in Nikolai, on top of the whole Ukraine, there was water supply uh, problems. The pipeline was exploded uh, and in the beginning of the war. And Nikolai still doesn't have uh, drinking water from tap. It is technical water, salty water from the uh, mix of sea and river. Uh, more than 100 of MDM employees, and as well as uh, employees of the university and other organizations, have been evacuated. Half of the city left uh, their homes. And uh, now, as about the MDM employees, they're working in four locations uh, in uh, Nikolaev, in Uzgorod, in Poland, and Romania. And we are very thankful to uh, our uh, to, to Romania and to Poland countries and uh, Daman as an organization who hosted half of our employees uh, outside the territory of Ukraine. But men, of course, couldn't leave, and in Uzgorod and those who live in Nikolaev, they are still here. So the, we had to evacuate about uh, more than 500 uh, employees with uh, their families. That was quite a work. And now they uh, live uh, far from homes. Uh, of course, uh, uh, life is not so bad because we have work, we have care, we have where to be, we have facilities. But uh, we need a victory as soon as possible. And all these words would not be much. Uh, if we don't show you a video, because uh, video uh, says more than thousands of words.
uh, video is built as an interview and it is uh, not from mass media. It is our own employees uh, have been interviewed in this uh, video. So this is the same facts as I have told you, but uh, a little uh, more visual. So I hope you see the screen and now I will launch the video. I hope you will hear the sound. Ракета одна за одной. Двадцять четверте лютого две тисячі двадцять другого року назавжди поділили життя українців на до і після повномасштабного вторгнення військ Російської Федерації. З першого дня російської агресії окупанти нещадно обстрілюють ракетами українські міста. Миколаїв загарбники накривали вогнем дев'ять місяців. У місті понівечено сотні будинків. Зрівна волна була такої сили, що людей відбрасувала, і ми залишилися без житла, к сожалению. Напротив нас квартири стоять, там нету третьего, четвертого, пятого этажей, а первый и второй, значит, как это можно сказать, просто ни потолков, ни стен, ни, ни пола, ничего. Первый взрыв 17 августа, 19 августа, опять повторно, в 4 утра у нас в доме вылетели все окна, крыша полностью... Отсутствовал, в общем, все покрытие улетело в воздух. Моему, слава богу, остался жив, здоров, но у него было такое внутреннее состояние, вот он не мог прийти в себя. Ракети окупантів пошкодили десятки навчальних закладів, крамниць та офісних приміщень. Постраждав і офіс компанії. В районі половини першої ночі я услышав прильоти. Ну, в то время у нас же почти каждую ночь прилетали ракеты. Северная и западная сторона здания полностью выбиты были окна. И весь двор внутри был засыпан стеклами. На втором и на третьем этаже было разрушено практически все. Російські окупанти навесні минулого року навмисно підірвали водогін. Відтоді майже півмільйони міста залишилися без очищеної питної води. І дотепер миколаївці з баклажками носять воду зі свердловин, очищену воду розвозить електротранспорт. А тут усе місто змушено було займатися водним менеджментом. Технічна вода, питна вода. Зараз російські війська щодня обстрілюють ракетами сусідні з Миколаєвом місто Херсон. 11 листопада 2022 року українські захисники звільнили його від загарбників. До цього херсонці від перших днів повномасштабної війни майже 9 місяців жили в окупації. Майже одразу війська зайшли до Херсону. У тебе не було зовсім у окупації ніяких прав. Постійно забирали людей на перевірки з будь-якого приводу. Наприклад, до мого брата прийшли додому, дев'ять людей з автоматами. Погрожували автоматом його 12-річному сину. Ось забрали, п'ять діб тримали його у підвалі, без їжі, без води. Його на, на допити постійно тягали. І... Ну, потім, слава Богу, відпустили. Але це не єдина історія, і декого не відпустили і досі. 17 працівників Херсонського офісу компанії були змушені евакуюватися з міста, як і багато українців, які рятували життя своїх дітей та близьких, тому покинули рідні домівки. Та взимку росіяни розпочали енергетичний терор. Окупанти обстрілюють ракетами об'єкти критичної інфраструктури. Люди практично виживають без світла і тепла. Вони не вдома, вони орендують квартири, вони живуть у маленьких кімнатах, діти навчаються удалено в школі. І коли немає світла, це дуже драматично, коли майбутнє нашої країни не може долучитися до знань. 
Багато співробітників компанії знайшли свій тимчасовий дім в Польщі та Румунії. Саме тут працює Асоціація допомоги українцям, яка їх підтримує, планує ще більше важливих заходів. Бо, ну, дуже гарна нагода побачити, як 100 українців з діточками збираються, як вони співають українські пісні, як вони танцюють. Всі свої надії на мир вони відобразили в своїх танцях і піснях. Мундем завжди підтримує своїх співробітників і надає всю необхідну гуманітарну допомогу – ліки, продуктові набори, засоби гігієни, необхідні речі для дітей. Найвищу ціну, яку платить український народ у цій війні – це людське життя, життя захисників, які боронять Україну. П'ятеро працівників компанії МДЕМ зараз на фронті. Один з них тільки не одружився 23 лютого напередодні російського вторгнення. На жаль, один із співробітників компанії загинув. Як і мільйони українців, працівники МДЕМ мають єдину мрію. Ми все чекаємо миру, чекаємо, щоб усі наші військові повернулися додому. І, зокрема, наші співробітники, яких ми особисто знаємо, за яких ми особисто переживаємо. Якщо є мир, то всього іншого можна досягти. Тільки з перемогою, бо без перемоги це не мир. Ми повинні побідити і повинні прийти до тої нормальної життя, в якій живе все, все чоловічество. І побіда у нас однозначно буде. Ми повинні не просто працювати, а ми повинні віддавати себе повністю роботі щоб виковати нашу перемогу. Чим раніше, тим краще. Я мрію, щоб світова спільнота ще принципіальніше виступила проти цієї війни, надала зброю, підтримала і допомогла Україні перемогти щонайшвидше. А час – це життя. І ми хочемо, щоб наше життя, життя наших рідних, життя у всіх українців було збережено. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olena. It has been a very nice, uh, how can I say, synthesis of a reality that is, um, how can I say, uh, expressed from the points of view of the people and the way in which they are feeling this, uh, this reality. So the way in which we have conceived this session is uh, just to put uh, several perspectives and in the second part to have some discussions around these uh, perspectives. So this is one perspective that we would like to take into consideration in our discussion later on. So if there are questions, comments and so on, please keep them for the second part, because now we would like to invite and we shall move to another geography to uh, Professor Naji Inji. He uh, is a very well-known uh, scientist. Uh, he had a brilliant career in the field of physics, uh, having, uh, let's say, professorship on different other, uh, let's say, meridians and so on. Uh, came back to, to Turkey and uh, contributed uh, to the School of Physics at the University of Bosphorus or, ba or Boazici, how is called a very traditional uh, let's say, higher education institution that started from Roberts College some century ago. Actually, they have also a very nice celebration very, very soon. And today, uh, Professor uh, uh, Naji Inji, he is the rector of this uh, university. Uh, the Bosphorus uh, University, the Boazici University, uh, of course, it was a sort of setting the... The most, the most important uh, part of the society in Turkey, the intellectuals, the statesmen, the people from the, let's say, uh, decision positions, they have been passing through this very important school 
of, uh, of Turkish uh, education and Turkish culture, we could say it like that. So uh, now uh, living in a very complicated uh, geography with uh, open conflicts all around the borders uh, and uh, also having uh, these uh, uh, unfortunate uh, cataclysms and natural disasters, in Turkey there is already, we could say, a sort of preparedness for educating people around this. So, Professor uh, Inji, Rector uh, Inji, please uh, be so kind and introduce your perspective to how the education has to be conceived in this very, very special context of conflicts. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Adan, for this nice introduction and uh, good words. So I hope I deserve all these nice things. As you said, uh, my university is 160 years old. It was founded in 19, 1863 in Istanbul. It was the first American university outside the borders of United States. It was founded as Robert College. So this lasted until 1971. And the name was Robert College and it had you know, um, high school, and also it had the college part, the university part. And then in 1971, I think the board of trustees, they decided that uh, it was not sustainable, you know, to uh, continue with both high school and the college. And they came to a decision that they should keep the high school, which is still Robert College, and ex it exists, you know, it's a neighbor, uh, it's very close to us. So that name, Robert College, continues as high school, and it is very famous also in Turkey. Uh, and uh, the university, but the college part was transferred to the Turkish government in 1971. And then after, before 1971, we had all these uh, uh, presidents and the faculty and members, they were coming from the United States and all the presidents were Americans. After 1971, so then the Turkish government, it became the state school, of course, the, the funding was coming from, still it is coming from the states, Turkey, and the presidents are appointed by the government, by the president. And the majority of the faculty members are Turkish. We have all the, like more than 100 uh, faculty members, foreigners from various countries, from uh, Europe, from uh, United States, from other parts of the world. Um, so just to give you a little perspective about the quality of the university, it is a research university. It's one of the top universities in the country. Like, um, for example, around 3 million uh, candidates, they take the national um, exams, national university national exams. So among these three, like 3 million students, so when you look at within the first 100, the top 100, so 68 students, so prefer to come to Boaz University. When you look at the first 1,000, the top 1,000, so it was 773, almost 800. So, and the, the rest, you know, this 200 within 1,000, they prefer to go to the medic, medical school. We don't have medical school. If we had a medical school, so you get one, within 1,000, you get everyone. So it's, it's a dream of, you know, every, students or a faculty to really to have a position to be students to get education in this nice environment and nice university so after this brief introduction so uh, i just would like to say a couple of words about what i think about the education for human security actually in the end of my uh, talk, I will just summarize with a couple of words. I mean, what is what is the magic behind? I mean, what should be done? I will say that. But before I say 
those couple of words that I really deep down in my heart, I believe, I just want to, to give, give um, uh, just a uh, wider perspective what I think uh, about uh, education for the human security. So I prepared a couple of lines. So let me just uh, uh, say a couple of things on them. So first of all, when you look at the, the role of education in supporting human security is first of all, a multifaceted issue. So as you know, that there is no single response to this, although some problems are perceived to be global, there are others which are local or regional. So when the human security is concerned, which is the, the, the first priority issue for everybody, we initially think of conflict and terror attacks, this especially in the light of the recent Russia-Ukraine war. However, we can extend the risks to include you know, financial crisis, natural disasters, disease, artificial intelligence guided terror and biological attacks, climate hazards, carbonization, and food security. So this list can therefore be extensive. The devastating earthquake in Turkey has shown us that natural disasters can destroy cities and easily kill hundreds of thousands of people within minutes. People can be trapped under ruins, as we saw on TV screens, suffering from unimaginable pain and helplessly dying. There was a degree of paralysis for the first critical day after the tremor struck due to the unimaginable scale of the disaster. In Turkey, after this recent earthquake, 11 cities were totally destroyed and hundreds of thousands of thousands showed reverberated, heightening the continued fear and anxiety. Roads were blocked, runways unusable, logistics personnel and their families were themselves affected. Shock had become trauma. That might be the worst part of this you know, uh, disaster. So critical to the prevention and management of such disasters is highly quality education, of course. Only education in its wider sense can deal with the issues of inadequate compliance, poor construction, and unethical behaviors that we have witnessed recently in Turkey. Education cannot therefore simply be considered as the transfer of knowledge from one agent to another. For example, from a lecturer or teacher to students, or from a speaker to their audience, or from a web page or internet forum to its followers. If human security is a priority, then education must have a far more profound and ambitious mission. And whilst online resources have their place, face-to-face -face interaction is essential since we need credible role models that is that is what I wanted to say, you know. We need credible role models to disseminate guidance and mentoring, which is not just technical, but values-based in purpose. Because when you don't have values, I mean, these values can be religious values, society values, you know, the values. Because without these values, you don't have awareness. Once you don't have awareness, then those who are engineers can construct poor structures. You know, they can steal from iron, they can steal from cement, you know. So they don't, they don't care about the, the end because we have the lack of the awareness. And this awareness can be only given to those, you know, who are getting this education through good role models and it should be face-to-face 
And I think that is the that should be the, the, the main priority of the education. Because I mean, knowledge is everywhere. You can get knowledge. I mean, knowing something is not, you know, being aware of something. So the, the, I believe that this recent disaster, you know, even the Russia-Ukraine war and all these natural and all artificial disaster, whatever you say, so are due to the lack of the awareness, you know, because once if you are aware of something, you think about it deep down and then you take the precautions and then you calculate the ends, the, what is your, you are going to suffer in the end or what you are going to get in the end. So recent pandemic showed us, yes, it is available. So you can get everything online from internet. But that's just, you know, getting getting knowledge. But the knowledge, unfortunately, it doesn't solve these problems. So the awareness so should be should be really possessed Thank through you. role models and with the face-to-face -face education. That's what I believe, Thank you know. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for this perspective, a very important aspect that uh, in any kind, when we are talking about education, we have to start from the values from uh, focusing on on building values and this is a very nice perspective thank you very much uh, professor uh, inji so uh, now i uh, because uh, we have quite a limited uh, time i would uh, kindly ask also uh, the, the speakers to try to help this discussion by concentrating a little bit let's say the the points that they would like to to address so um, uh, we would like to keep at least 20 minutes at the end for some open discussion and for some possible types of, uh, of joint uh, proposals. So uh, now uh, we would like to change the perspective. We shall move to an expert in policies in education, an expert in uh, education uh, science, uh, Professor Romitz Yuku. He is the vice rector of um, the University of Bucharest, the flagship university in uh, in uh, higher education in Romania, and uh, at the same time he is a very well known expert in the area of uh, let's say policies, uh, uh, regulatory frameworks, and aspects related to uh, establishing the pathways for uh, higher education in Romania. So, uh, Professor Yuku. Try to condensate <laughs> and uh, pinpoint on some aspects that we have to take it into consideration from the perspective of policies. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mahmoud. I'm very uh, honored to join this uh, extraordinary event. And uh, of course, I have the privilege, uh, if you agree, just to share with you a very concentrated uh, presentation. It's a little bit larger with. Uh, the number of slides that I could share with you after this presentation. I will be pointed out some important slides which are relevant for the topic uh, in, in this moment, uh, uh, treated as a priority for us. And I am pleased to, uh, to talk um, related to uh, the possibility of treating uh, a new building resilience uh, through um, education in the European uh, university alliances. That's a new topic, a very important one, and I just wanted to uh, underline how this topic uh, in this moment are part of the uh, context which is appreciated very much, deeper analyzed uh, from the European perspective, from the European Union, and this is not only a consequence uh, which has been uh, presented or derived from uh, the transnational cooperation, which is crucial in this moment from this perspective. And uh, starting with uh, all the topics presented and expressly uh, attributed by the European Commission and, and, and other contexts, uh, we rely very much, and you will see a little bit uh, uh, later, that uh, one idea which is in this moment important according to the COVID-19 the new challenges which are just uh, creating uh, um, from the very perspective. And, and this slide you will see here and the second uh, bullet point, a survey showed that the members of the first European alliance is the first wave, first 17, now there are all in all 44 alliances, uh, perceive that being in an alliance helped them to navigate the crisis 
and is likely to allow them to recover faster by pulling their resources and strengths together. That's an important uh, pass for the new uh, idea, which are also linked with uh, internationalization, uh, with cooperation to solve global challenges, promotion of fundamental values, and of course, uh, tackling with uh, foreign interferences in this moment. And we know how so difficult it is to deal with this uh, segment. From the perspective of resilience, uh, we are going to, to treat in, um, in a way I will present to you this uh, is perhaps a picture which is uh, very uh, inspirational from the European uh, uh, universities uh, modality to, to treat a different uh, perspective like uh, promoting European democratic values, deeper transnational cooperation among European universities. We are really very much in favor of structuring and promoting this kind of uh, uh, example, transnational projects for uh, democratic values. Uh, skills. Uh, another interesting one, SDGs, as you know, we are very much committed on, on this context uh, also. The new instrument for the new diplomacy, soft diplomacy, education is an important matter. And what's happening uh, here, uh, what Gary and the wonderful team are just uh, helping and also, Eben, you are doing a great job, is to put education in the middle of process of creating a real diplomacy from soft diplomacy to a real diplomacy through education and higher education institutions are fully committed to um, try to go further in this initiative. Of course, that's, um, that's the sense. Um, I wanted just to uh, show to you one aspect which has been treated as, uh, as um, an important uh, echoing uh, issue. It's uh, the uh, awareness to be uh, in the very moment of this one, uh, it's to be uh, how to say um, competitive for this environment, which is globally treated, and uh, you will see in the presentation because I am just uh, um, sending you around uh, at the, the end. This is an analysis, very interesting one related to the number of students, the attractiveness of our universities, and the way of uh, fighting together for uh, going on in different areas like Africa, Asia. Uh, and other um, neighboring countries like Ukraine in this moment, and also China and uh, and uh, the others for increasing and uh, how to say going on with uh, a soft diplomatical perspective, which is linked to 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 the education. Um, also, Western Balkans are, and the neighboring countries are so important for the policies promoted by the European alliances, but. Because in this moment, uh, countries like Serbia are member in the European alliances, are participating with the, the rights to do it in, in a very nice uh, perspective, uh, with um, uh, um, target which are just touching China and the other countries for becoming in a very competitive environment at the level of the European um, uh, global gateway, if you like, because this process has been approved as a strategy for international cooperation developed and uh, uh, important put on on um, on the bridge. This is the Europe's uh, global gateway, an important reaction and counter reaction for um, developing and structuring uh, ambition to ramp uh, Europe's universities with the coordinated support uh, for um, the next uh, further developments. I'm just keeping some uh, perspective on on the uh, geostrategical perspective and soft diplomacy's orientation in in this moment amongst stakeholders and the science diplomacy global networks and here you will see a presentation i have uh, made a very interesting uh, more or less research work but you will see when the presentation will be in, in your hands and you will dealt with um, a presentation of all aspects which are dealing with the resilience and soft diplomacy for the european universities giving you examples from different alliances Utopia, uh, Civis Alliance uh, as well, Neurotech EU, Charm EU, uh, Cycle EU, that's the name of the European alliances deeply engaged in different topics which are linked with uh, Unique, EU Connexus, UFE, UNITA, and uh, all they have been very much involved. You will see all the presentations. I'm going to stop only one. A sentence according to the resilience uh, to the Ukrainian case, and I'm very grateful to Olena for the presentation. Uh, the 41 and 2, all the 41 alliances, they have put together 
a lot of efforts to create not only a statement, but in the same kind of bridge between us and the uh, Ukrainian universities deeper in the 4U1 and 4U decade. I'm very grateful to you for attention. I'm stopping here uh, in Eden. I'm very, uh, how to say, aware about the constraints of the time, but I'm sure that the presentation entirely will be um, uh, dedicated uh, finally to the objectives and the purpose of this uh, uh, workshop. Thank you so much for inviting not, not on, Thank you very much. Not only the presentation, but don't forget about the paper that has to be prepared for the publication uh, afterwards. So once again, thank you very much. A very important perspective introducing this, uh, let's say, approach of, uh, of European uh, university alliances and, uh, and resilience as a core value let's call it like that within this and uh, now i would like to uh, invite uh, michel deneken president deneken uh, michel deneken he is coming as the president of the university of strasbourg a university with several nobel laureates that are uh, now uh, uh, let's say uh, defining uh, the values and uh, the knowledge uh, advancement uh, in science worldwide but uh, uh, professor deneken he's a theologist and actually a person who uh, had um, a very important uh, let's say uh, research activities during his phd in the um, uh, uh, let's say evaluation and study of the great schismas so uh, a sort of uh, a very nice uh, discussion we unfortunately it was too short the time that we had together but uh, this is now the possibility now to introduce uh, from your perspective as a theologist as a, let's say catholic uh, uh, practitioner following a very very important perspective also in this uh, in this field what do you think that um, has to be a fundamental new leapfrog in changing the way in which we are educating and we educate ourselves for uh, for this uh, um, let's say overcoming of the conflicts thank you yeah, i must um, uh, say that it was very impressive at the beginning to have the the witness of our uh, ukrainian colleague uh, and this is the the good way to introduce uh, our panel um, Strasbourg is, you know, the seat of the European Parliament. It's not Brussels, it's Strasbourg, uh, the Parliament. And I must say, uh, our university is uh, the result of the European hatreds, conflicts, but also uh, capacity of resiliation and reconciliation. If the seat of the Parliament of Europe is in Strasbourg, it, that means that as um, 1945, both um, countries on the left, on the right side of the Rhine, were able to build bridges and not to destroy them, um, this reconciliation was a sign that Europe is possible. Um, because my university roots on Lutheran and Catholic roots, but also on Jewish tradition, Greek and Latin tradition. We have also had a very great um, uh, openness at the beginning of the 20th century as we were German um, with, um, uh, with uh, Eastern Europe. We had, for instance, a, a Greek Orthodox and a, Roman, uh, a Romanian college in our university. You know, that is also important. No, Strasbourg, we were um, 40 years German and during this German period, we became one of the greatest uh, uh, universities in Europe because the Kaiser, uh, the German Kaiser, wanted Strasbourg to be um, a great place of research and teaching and learning. So our heritage today is also this German-French tradition, this tradition between two religions, between also Jewish culture and Christian culture. And today we try to, to make these values alive in our teaching, learning, research, but also 
being a European university open to everybody. And I give you three examples. As this terrible uh, war one year ago burst out between Ukraine and Russia. The first students we helped were not Ukrainian, but Russian, because they had their financial means cut off by the decisions of um, punishing uh, Russia. And I, we had a meeting with the Russian and the Ukrainian and the Belarus students. We told them, your identity card is not um, relevant. What is important is your student card, and you have all the same student card. And uh, I must say, one of the important uh, commitments of my presidency is that on this campus, European values has to have to show that research, teaching, and learning together, also in opening Erasmus, um, we, we must be able that on our campus, enemies in their own countries can be, I must not say friends, but collaborators. The second example is Strasbourg is committed with Azerbaijan um, as uh, the French uh, president, the president of the French Republic 10 years ago wanted that uh, French universities invest the, the research in uh, Azerbaijan. And we said, okay, we, we have uh, built a cooperation uh, between uh, Baku uh, Oil and Gas University and Strasbourg, it's called UFAS, French uh, Azerbaijan uh, University. Uh, and this is also important for us not to forget that Europe is not the political Europe only, but also uh, a cultural Europe. Um, and it's also important that young people of Azerbaijan um, discover the, the research and the values of um, Western universities. And it's a very uh, amazing adventure. We began with bachelor, we continued with master, and now we, we open PhD schools with uh, Baku. And this is also um, a way to discover other people's other cultures and as a theologian, as a surgeon, I find very interesting that how the, the Islamic uh, tradition is um, politically um, um, run by the governments. Uh, that means that um, the, the Islamic tradition in Europe is not only a tradition of Islamism, uh, as we know the caricature, caricature in, in France. The other um, point, the last point I will say is that we are a um, um, university from the Upper Rhine. That means we, we, we have a political um, um, legal structure called um, European campus with uh, uh, Basel in Switzerland, Freiburg, Karlsruhe in Germany, Mulhouse in France. Our purpose is to make these values of European um, humanism of the, humanism, the upper Rhine humanism from the 16th century to make it it's, um, very um, actual and very real um, in three ways. The first is the knowledge of uh, foreign uh, languages, multi multilingualism. Secondly, um, the multi culturalism in Europe. Europe is not only Brussels English speaking, but it's um, a puzzle of wonderful cultures, and we must know that uh, people in Europe want their cultures to be respected and accepted, not to be washed off in a in a great uh, um, English uh, globish English culture, and it's or a, to be diluted. Point. Yes, diluted. And the, the third commitment for us is that. It is also uh, for, for France, um, uh, a university like Strasbourg has to be a trigger uh, to um, open uh, our country to other cultures, the borders of uh, the, the, the east side of France, but also the east side of Europe. And uh, we will continue to be very committed with uh, countries from Eastern Europe. And uh, in the alliance we, we are, 
uh, Epicure, we have um, uh, we have Polish, uh, Austrian, Greek, uh, and um, and, uh, and uh, Holl um, Holland universities, as Amsterdam, and this is also important uh, for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, amazing uh, perspective. Uh, we were, of course, the most important aspect is to bring together the opposite uh, points to let them know that their, uh, you'd say, future is only together and uh, uh, continuing in some sense the value of the European universities uh, as a space for free debate, as a space for expressing interest, but at the same time, a place for respecting, let's say, the positions of the others. So thank you very much, uh, President Deneken. Thank you for what you are doing also with the, with this uh, Epicur Alliance that uh, is, uh, of course, one of the, let's say, uh, marking the pathways for the future. Thank you uh, for, for all. Now, uh, we heard a lot about all these risks and aspects like that so we are moving to a uh, structural engineer by uh, formation by research with a brilliant career in the american universities uh, professor armand derkuregian uh, he uh, developed his own career as an expert in risk uh, assessment evaluation of uh, different type of uh, of uh, structural uh, response to different types of risks and, uh, of course, on the other side, he has also a second, uh, let's say, area uh, contributing to the establishment and the development of the American University in Armenia, a fantastic attempt that, uh, in some sense, uh, has a, a very important perspective, one of them being also to contribute to, uh, let's say, knowledge promotion and uh, and education, as it was also mentioned by uh, Professor Naji Inji, based on values. So, Armen, please, sorry for <laughs> putting you that uh, that late, but uh, it was also a good opportunity to listen very, very important speakers before. Thank you. Thank you, uh, then thank you for the invitation. It is my pleasure to participate in this distinguished panel. Um, before addressing the main topic, and I will be five, seven minutes, no more. Uh, so before addressing the main topic, I would like to make some remarks about the recent tragic earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, and what universities can do to protect human security from such natural disasters. With sympathy for the thousands of victims in Turkey and Syria, I'd like to recall that the American University of Armenia came about as a result of a similar tragic event, that is the Spitak earthquake of December 7, 1988 in Northern Armenia, that killed more than 25,000 people and made hundreds of thousands homeless. In response to that tragic event, we resolved to set up an American style education system that would bring knowledge and expertise in earthquake engineering, but also a culture of critical thinking rooted in transparency, integrity, and evidence-based decision-making. Through the efforts of the university's faculty and researchers, seismic design codes in Armenia were improved, and modern methods of earthquake-resistant construction, particularly the base isolation technology, were introduced. This technology would essentially isolate the building from the destructive effects of earthquake ground motions was made possible through the efforts of local engineers through training and experimentation at the university. Today, Armenia ranks second to Japan in the per capita number of base isolated buildings, partly because the population is small in Armenia. In spite of this advance, sadly, many Soviet era buildings in Armenia remain vulnerable to earthquakes. Our efforts in this area must continue and hopefully through collaboration and exchange of expertise among academics, we will improve human security from earthquakes 
across the region. Now, turning to the main topic of human security from regional conflicts, I note that we are currently witnessing two major conflicts in our region. One is Russia's efforts to deny Ukraine the right to freely choose a path for the future of its people. And second is Azerbaijan's efforts to ethnically cleanse Nagorno-Karabakh of its indigenous Armenian population while blatantly making irredentist claims against Armenia proper. While we feel fully synthesized with the plight of the Ukrainian people and support their basic rights, we must similarly recognize the rights of the Armenian inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh to live and thrive on their ancestral lands. Since December 12, 2022, that's about three months ago, Azerbaijani so-called eco and activists sponsored by the government in Baku have blocked the Lachin Corridor, which is the only lifeline connecting Nagorno-Karabakh with Armenia and the outside world. This has resulted in severe shortages of food, medicine, fuel, and other essential necessities, causing physical and psychological distress and putting the lives of 120,000 inhabitants at risk. Schools have had to close, depriving 30,000 children of their right to education. At the American University of Armenia, there are many students from Nagorno-Karabakh. They've been unable to visit their homes and are worried about the well-being of their families and are experiencing trauma and distress, this naturally affecting their education. Likewise, there are many students in Nagorno-Karabakh who are interested in applying for admission to our university. They've been unable to travel to Yerevan to take the necessary admission tests. Two months ago, President Aliyev of Azerbaijan declared that, and I quote, the Lachin Corridor is open for any Armenian who wishes to leave Nagorno-Karabakh, a declaration that openly attests to his intention to cleanse the Armenians from their ancestral home. In addition to these threats, the Baku regime has been falsifying and obliterating Armenian heritage sites, calling them Caucasian Albanian, and erasing ancient Armenian biblical scripts adorning the walls of monasteries and other monuments. My own ancestral history goes back to the city of Julfa on the shore of Aras River in Nakhichevan. In 2005, Azerbaijani soldiers destroyed more than 2,000 in, intricately carved cross stones in the cemetery of Jolfa, a UNESCO heritage site. They were broken into pieces and dumped in the Aras River. More so, over, Professor Kurigian. Yes, I'm. Uh, so, I'm so, so, yeah, I'm if you can summarize, yeah. Yes, I'm. I'm close. Uh, hundreds of Armenian ancient churches and monuments were destroyed in Nakhichevan, so that today there is no record of Armenians ever having lived in that area. These actions were criticized by the renowned Azeri writer and Nobel Prize nominee Akram Ailisli. Unfortunately, he has been severely punished for speaking up. Just a few points on what our roles as educators in addressing these kinds of regional conflicts and en enhancing security. First, as educators and academics, first and foremost, we must concern ourselves with making quality education accessible to future generations across the region, regardless of ethnicity, nationality, and socioeconomic status. Second, as educators, we have a special obligation to instill in our students universal values, respect for the history and culture of all nations, and respect for human life. We must also adhere to a standard, of pro standard protocol of goodness and civility. I hope we can each do that within our universities through open debates and freedom of thought. Third, the educa as educators, we have the privilege of academic freedom, and with it comes the responsibility to lead by example. 
we must denounce the falsification of history for political purposes, erasure of cultural heritage, and, and violations of human rights. Fourth, as educators, we recognize the importance of funding for academic research and discovery. However, we must be diligent in making sure that those funding sources will not in any shape or form compel us to com compromise our professional integrity and undermine the cred credibility of our universities. Finally, as educators, we can assume an important role in easing regional conflicts by not yielding to emotions, political posturing, militaristic rhetoric, and aggressive pronouncements that ferment hatred. Instead, we must strictly rely on evidence-based scholarship and formulate ideas that bring about understanding among peoples, helping them to bridge their cultural and historical differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Derkir. I would like to uh, move now towards um, Greece and uh, Professor Nikolaos Theodosiu. Professor Theodosiu, he is also a civil engineer by formation, focusing particularly on uh, hydro uh, the construction and uh, hydrotechnical uh, aspects. And uh, then, uh, of course, he um, was involved in many other activities related to the sustainable development, uh, water uh, management uh, aspects. He is coordinating uh, different types of uh, projects, and uh, he is involved also in activities at the level of United Nations and so on. Uh, but uh, here we invited him as the chair of the Black Sea uh, chapter of the Sustainable Development Solution Network. Uh, it's a large organization. We offer you two minutes <laughs> to, to address uh, your point of, uh, of view, because then we would like uh, really to, to stick with the, the, the time window that was uh, offered to us generously by the World Academy of Art and Science. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Adam. You already used two minutes to introduce me, so we just... <laughs> I would just salute you. <laughs> now, um, th thank you very much. I would try to be very, very brief uh, today. Um, it's um, it's really a very important issue. Uh, human security is uh, it's a prerequisite for everything, for our future, for our for development, for um, uh, for freedom, uh, for um, uh, prosperity, for everything. So we need to to see into this uh, into this issue very uh, with a great uh, attention. Um, but if we step, if we make a take a step back and try to see the what uh, what are the risks? I mean, we discussed a lot about the risks of um, human security. Of course, it's very difficult to talk about anything else when we are um, when we have the the war in Ukraine in progress. Uh, and it's very difficult to to talk about anything else about um, on human security. But um, let's not forget that uh, human security is also related to to hunger. It's also related to health. It's also related. To, um, uh, um, to 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 um, human resources like um, uh, water or the clean environment, uh, climate change is a threat to human security. Everything is a threat to to human security. And if we can gather all this, we see sustainable development goals. So, what I would like to bring into this um, uh, uh, table, this virtual, that um, was asked for us to to, to present. Uh, we know this um, saying by uh, Albert Einstein that we cannot solve our problems uh, with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we need to have a new perspective. And this new perspective, this new perspective could come through a new analysis, a new approach uh, or based on these uh, the sustainable development goals. So I think this is a, a good starting point to analyze uh, what are the means and what are the reasons that um, uh, human security is uh, uh, threatened. And um, uh, education, of course, since um, many of us are related to universities uh, and our network is a, it's a network of universities. Um, the one you mentioned, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network for the wider area of the Black Sea. So our role is through education 
to um, to define new values uh, for the um, for the younger generation in order to to avoid uh, the extent that uh, these um, threats uh, appear to um, to have today and um, they we resulted in a in a very bad situation and it's very difficult to um, to find um, uh, ways to um, to to escape from this um, all these uh, reasons that um, all these situations that threaten uh, our own security, human security as a as a whole, as a total. So, um, I, in my opinion, we should take a step back, uh, analyze the uh, the risks, and the risks can be found easily in the Sustainable Development Goals. And through our educational system, and through um, education, not just information or um, uh, teaching, we need to to educate. We need to communicate. Uh, with the younger generation, in order to 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 give them the ability to to uh, not to make the same mistakes we we made in our generation, and we brought uh, the world in this um, very bad um, position. So, a final word. It was already mentioned, but I think we should emphasize on that is ethics, ethics on education. I think that could be uh, a good um, uh, solution to connect the uh, the risks with the results and to reduce this um, uh, global threat of um, uh, human security. Thank you. So Thank you very much. Uh, yes, that, that <laughs> was. And also with a very important aspect about ethics, uh, putting a, a very important emphasis on frames for, uh, for addressing this. So it's a very important uh, contribution. Thank you very much. Now, of course, uh, you have seen how beautiful it was conceived, this uh, panel, <laughs> with the uh, contributors coming from different uh, perspectives. Now we are introducing uh, Dr. Alberto Zucconi. He is a psychologist, actually, and he developed over his entire career a uh, human or, uh, let's say, uh, client-centered approach in uh, psychology, and he even uh, established an institute that uh, is doing an amazing job collaborating with different universities. We did a very nice collaboration with uh, uh, the team of Professor Tsukoni for uh, supporting and addressing issues on trauma-informed uh, care aspects in, in Ukraine. So, uh, dear Professor Tsukoni, also uh, because uh, you uh, are, uh, let's say, from the organizers as uh, the chair of the board of this uh, World Academy of Art and Science, and uh, the time is so limited, try to, uh, uh, let's say, synthesize your perspective in several minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a, a note. Uh much more modestly, I was uh, uh, my mentor, Carl Rogers, uh, developed uh, 80 years ago the person center approach uh, and just uh, following uh, in his steps. Um, I uh, totally agree with Nico about uh, the important ethics. Uh, and I think uh, I honestly appreciate that everything has been said uh, and uh, the significant steps uh, that we can do in, uh, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, for example. Uh, I also am an educator, and uh, I know that we can do better. Uh, just uh, to give you an idea, <laughs> Europe uh, launched uh, more than a quarter of a century ago the Bologna process. And uh, if you read uh, the bulletin that the Bologna process uh, published regularly, it says that uh, not only that we can do better, that we have to do better if we want to reach the goal to have in Europe that is a knowledge society. How to do better? Share the power and include the students in the process. The Bologna process underlined that. We have to involve the students in the design and curriculums. We have to involve the students in the evaluation of result of their studies. So we can do better. Actually, we know that a student-centered education or person-centered education or people-centered education, 80 years of research show that the results are better than traditional education. Why are we not doing more of that? I suspect that because 
to be student-centered and people-centered, and <clears throat> you need uh, to share power. You need uh, to promote a change, uh, not uh, being a professor-centered, uh, but uh, sharing the power with the, the stakeholders. Now, we know that uh, <laughs> we don't need just sociology, that the people that have power in every organization have a little difficulty of sharing uh, uh, with people that have less. And so that is the challenge. A challenge that has been also recognized for the many failure by the United Nations. The United Nations says that after many failure, top-down project, the very minimal results, that human security needs to be a people-centered project. Of course, because only if uh, we share and we unite, uh, as uh, our friend uh, from Ukraine uh, show, unite, uh, we better. Another thing, I collaborated with the World uh, Health Organization. Traditional medicine, uh, top down, uh, with the expert, uh, they doesn't work very well. The uh, Ottawa Charter, 1986, says, that uh, health is not the lack of illness, it's development of human potentialities, and health is not to be left of health experts. Health has to be protected and promoted where people live and work in their daily lives. Actually, health promotion works much better than the traditional prevention. But how come there are obstacles? Well, if you read, uh, for example, the uh, Australian uh, well-known uh, website, uh, Medicine Mongering, you would discover that how much money every year some uh, you know, uh, interest uh, pull together to contrast uh, the work uh, of uh, health promotion of the World Health Organization. So if uh, we want uh, to do better, we have to bring ethics and transparency. And also to give you just an example that uh, I collaborate uh, with Ed and no, with this uh, brutal invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, I was in Baku, I heard uh, from somebody in the ministry of Ukraine uh, how terrible things uh, were going on. I felt uh, so angry. And I said, I need just to be doing something, not to be angry and impotent. So I created my institute with the World Health Organization, with the World Academy of Art and Science, the World University Consortium, the Black Sea Consortium Network of University, but also other like the protect uh, our planet movement uh, and the Psychological Association of Ukraine, the trauma-informed care best practice. What are those? Those are what uh, universities still don't teach uh, to students uh, in uh, psychology, students in medicine, students uh, of uh, education, is uh, just to have uh, the skills that uh, allow you not to work with goodwill, but in your and re-traumatize people that need your help, but actually are going to be further damaged. So we've been uh, uh, for free uh, training, and we do more people uh, help uh, uh, professional in Ukraine, and we'll continue to do so. And uh, we will now, uh, with uh, collaborating uh, with Professor Inchi, also in Turkey and also in uh, Syria. And also as we will be able to raise funds uh, to anybody that needs uh, help. But uh, this help uh, would not be needed uh, in emergency if uh, just at the university, we would teach uh, the biopsychosocial paradigm and all we know because the trauma-informed care is 30 years old and still people have a degree in the helping profession and never heard about it. So I Thank think you. to finish it, that we need to pull all our knowledge together 
and really see what are the barriers to a better education and to better society. One of the ways that we know it works is to promote change by empowering and being centered on the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything that you are doing, Alberto. God bless you for all your efforts that, uh, that you are doing. So uh, now uh, we uh, move quickly to uh, Professor Simonovic. Uh, actually, uh, he is a fantastic uh, personality with a brilliant career in diplomacy, but also in, uh, in education, uh, in uh, aspects related to law. And at present, he is Assistant Secretary uh, General of the United uh, Nations, uh, having a, let's say, a global perspective. So from your uh, perspective, uh, also being uh, from this uh, region, the extended Black Sea region, let's call it like that, from Croatia, uh, knowing very well the context and also having this broader view, how you would appreciate the education needs uh, uh, and I would like uh, to share with you a specific experience I had as Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. Uh, in 2014, I have established a UN human rights monitoring mission in Ukraine. And the purpose why UN was doing that and why I was doing that was to provide a very objective, impartial information on human rights situation that are relevant for peace and security. It was a way to counter Russian narrative that there is a genocide going on, that Russian speakers are being systematically targeted and prosecuted. Yes, there were some instances of human rights violations, but they were not a state policy of Ukraine. So by uh, being objective, about all human rights violations, it was uh, a way uh, to uh, uh, prevent manipulations. And manipulations uh, in Ukraine are something that we are seeing now. Uh, it's a deliberate attempt to manipulate uncertainty and insecurity, saying uh, that uh, 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 history is being uh, repeated, uh, that Russian speakers are being prosecutors like it was during Second World War, is something that we've seen in former Yugoslavia as well, where uh, historical traumas of Serbs in Croatia and in Bosnia and Herzegovina were being deliberately manipulated through uh, Mr. Milosevic's propaganda as justification for aggressive wars. So we have seen all that and experienced all that in the wider region. What is the role of education? The role of education is strengthening resilience, strengthening resilience through uh, uh, education about human rights, uh, through putting people in the center, making them more resilient uh, to various forms uh, of manipulation. What is the basis of this education? Education about entitlement to human rights, uh, education uh, that is uh, uh, strengthening resilience of society. If there is something marking our situation today, it's an increase of uncertainty. It's related to climate change, it's related to conflicts, it's uh, related to threat of potential new pandemics, technological changes, uh, the population movements. What we need is certain uh, certainty in sense of guaranteeing human rights, that there will be solidarity, that there needs to be tolerance uh, towards diversity. With such an education, we are making societies uh, less, uh, less, uh, 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 less weak to various forms of manipulation of uh, various demagogic politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Simonovic, uh, for this uh, point and putting uh, the very clear frame uh, in this aspect. Uh, now, uh, we have uh, two questions, actually, on the Q&A uh, pen. 
panel uh, is about the fact that uh, Lean Rachel Anderson, she is uh, mentioning about why competitiveness, and I think that uh, it is clear that within this, uh, let's say, European framework, uh, the competitiveness is about always trying to come with new arguments and to present uh, what is the best approach for that. And uh, the same uh, was uh, she was adding also to why not quality and critical thinking have been already addressed by uh, by the distinguished speakers uh, today. That this is just the beginning. Uh, we shall uh, have a system of collaboration between us in the process of preparing uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, publication uh, aspect. And uh, during that, uh, we shall exchange also some other ideas. But if there is one small <laughs> two words think that you somebody would like to add now is the moment don't lose it <laughs> okay so thank you very much uh, olena once again uh, thank you for uh, for your contribution and uh, once again we wish you on the occasion let's say of this very important day but also, unfortunately, in the very, very uh, difficult moment that uh, Ukraine is passing. And let us hope that also, from the education perspective, we shall be able to bring, to put together different concepts that will not allow for the future generation to repeat this kind of, of traumas. Thank you very much for everything.